Hello and welcome everybody to the next panel. Thank you for your patience. We're a bit after time, but I think that should work just fine. Please take a seat. Uh, welcome to the next panel. Privacy is big, big business, moderated by Dr. Sita Gerses and organized as well. So thank you very much for inviting that fantastic panel. And I hand it over to you. Thank you. And actually, the panel was organized by Timon and Donald. I'll introduce them in a moment. Um, so please take a seat. And Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs> we can still say that it's January, right? OK. Um, let's let people sit down. You can hear me well? Yes. All right, great. Um, so information privacy um, has many aspirations. One is individual privacy protection. And what we mean by that is the protection of a person's data traces so they, not, they cannot be abused or used against them. Another known one is protection from surveillance. Oscar Gandhi and later many other scholars wrote about the segmentation of populations to desirable and undesirable segments. And already surveillance as a framework leads to the promise of privacy to protect against power asymmetries that arise from the amassing of data about populations. In previous times, we would mainly refer to information as asymmetries with respect to state intelligence or state power. But we increasingly also get concerned about other kinds of power, two of which we would like to bring into view today, market and infrastructural power. The pursuit of privacy has found some manifestation in technical design, which I believe many of you know. As privacy engineers or privacy advocates, um, we champion the development and deployment of privacy technologies, or what is in the field called privacy enhancing technologies. In past work, Carmela Troncoso, Claudia Diaz, and later in conversation with Marta Poon, we aim to put to words how pets, privacy enhancing technologies, translate privacy as a right or an aspiration into the technical space. We came up with two main principles that pay pets aim to operationalize. These can be summarized bluntly as data minimization and purpose limitation. Data minimization ensures that as little data is collected by the overall system, if at all. This data resides on devices that are assumed to be under the control of the users and not third parties. We like to call this also distribution of trust or avoidance of single point of failure. And the purpose limitation, which is a second principle, ensures that the little data that the third party does collect is cut to purpose and cannot be easily repurposed. In other words, pets introduce mechanisms to avoid function creep. In fact, if we define it this way, pets are not only there to protect the confidentiality of data or privacy, but deliberately block the current extractive logic of digital systems that live from continuous redesign and optimization of services for the pursuit of revenues. But we will see throughout the panel that industry has interpreted these principles differently, if not too liberally. Some of the reasons they have been able to interpret the use of pets as they wish, and I, by day I refer to industry, is because pets are new. It takes a moment to really understand what a design is doing, especially if they're not designed or deployed transparently. But also, we have not seen much enforcement into pets. However, these are not the topics of this panel. Rather, <laughs> all very exciting, but not today, all right? Um, we want to focus on a new sort of power, which we summarize as market and infrastructural power, which sometimes requires and sometimes allows these companies to introduce pets in a way that may provide some individual protections, but at the same time transforms power relationships to their benefit, an unintuitive result. We posit that this has to do with something we call the rise of computational infrastructures. This is a topic we study at TU Delft with our research group. And by computational infrastructures, we refer to cloud environments, as well as mobile or end devices that have practically become their accessories. So all of your mobile devices and potentially my desktop. <clears throat> what we have seen over the last decade 
is a bloating of this infrastructure, as well as the concentration of its control with Amazon and Microsoft dominating the clouds and Google and Apple dominating the devices. In our project, we hypothesize the following about these computational infrastructures. One, current computational infrastructures, so clouds and end devices like mobile phones, Internet of Things, which are increasingly rendered as their accessories, are organized to become the production environment for all digital services. So if anyone wants to develop a service, and therefore anyone wants to use such a device, they will have to partially or wholly pass through these computational infrastructures, which happen to be concentrated in the hands of a few companies. Two, these computational infrastructures we have today are not the result of, tradition, uh, result of traditional market dynamics, meaning people demanding these infrastructures and the markets delivering, but instead we pos posit that a whole series of events after the 2008 financial crisis led to the financialization of tech companies and to the bloating of cloud-based services. And three, given this financialization, aside from being difficult to um, pronounce, it's a complex phenomenon, these companies are under pressure to grow. They need to expand into health, education, logistics, supply chains, you name it. They do so not by collecting data, or with the promise of selling ads, but by capturing revenue generating operations of organizations. So if there's an organization, then it has some operations and they try to capture these operations and they're with the revenue associated with them. <clears throat> we observe that these companies are increasingly leaning on privacy by design or pets to cement or expand that infrastructural and market power as they expand into these different sectors. They do so by transformation of the relationship they, they have with end users, but also by reconfiguring the business ecosystem that depends on their computational infrastructures. In other words, they reshape business to business relationships globally. We're not the first people to raise concerns with respect to privacy and computational infrastructures. In a volume edited by Corinne Kaff, titled Eaten by the Internet, Siobhan Khal Sahib raises concerns about pets being only feasible and affordable for companies with large infrastructures. Referring to CDNs, he writes, while privacy preserving protocols are important for privacy, the reliance on expensive infrastructure has the effect of making them deployable only by large tech companies. This has ramifications for the politics of access to privacy on the internet and a danger that smaller organizations, again the B2B aspect, acting in the public interest will not be able to afford to provide privacy for their users. Which is still a different argument from what Michael Veal, who, says, who, talks, who writes in the same volume says, this situation places civil society organizations in a bind. Since Snowden, they have successfully rallied companies and the public behind encrypting communications, limiting some forms of state surveillance. But encryption technologies have moved on, and they can now more effectively encrypt analysis and computation as well. This is a much more open design space, where businesses can design complex pets to advantage them to the detriment of their competitors. So what we're observing in this panel is, is that pets are being instrumentalized sometimes genuinely and at, at other times to do confidentiality washing while being designed to bring business advantages or enable infrastructural expansion for the bigger players. The objective of today's panel is to provide you a quick glimpse into three empirical cases that demonstrate the different ways in which privacy is being instrumentalized by these companies that have greater control over our current computational infrastructures. So without much further ado, I'd like to turn to my panelists and let me quickly introduce them. To my left is Chris Schrusak. He's a public interest technologist and, Irish, and at the Irish Council of Civil Liberties, um, a senior fellow. His work focuses on privacy tech, anti-surveillance, emerging technologies, and algorithmic decision-making. Previously, he was a researcher in Darmstadt, Germany, where he worked on applied crypto cryptography, pets, and internet security. 
Today, he will talk about Google Privacy Sandbox, and we'll link it to privacy in internet standards making. Thank you for coming, Chris. Next, we'll have Tymon and Donald. Um, Tymon is a master's student at TU, De TU Delft in the Faculty of Technology Policy and Management, where I'm also based. He's been working with Donald and myself for a little under two years, and it has a strong interest in legal, economic, and ethical dimensions of digital technologies. And next to him is Donald, who is a PhD candidate in the same faculty. He is affiliated with our research group called the Programmable Infrastructures Group. His research explores how agile software production and computational infrastructures are changing the production of economic value globally. Tymon and Donald are going to talk about a case called Amazon Sidewalk, which is an extension to AWS <clears throat> that the company presents as a closed crowdsourced network. I'm not sure they use those words, but we do. <laughs> All right. Um, Carmela is going to be our last panelist, is an associate professor at EPFL in Lausanne. She heads the Springs Lab focused on security and privacy engineering. <clears throat> the work at this lab and Carmela's work focuses on understanding and mitigating the impact of technology on society. Their research focuses on the intersection of machine learning, security and privacy, development of privacy enhancing technologies and privacy engineering. Today, she'll be talking about what happened with contact tracing apps and what later became known as the Google Apple exposure notification. With that, Chris, I'd like to pass the word to you. Thank you, Seda. Um, so first is that I, when I first looked at Google's privacy sandbox, first the word privacy stands out because you'd assume that the word privacy in the name of a product or series of products would emphasize uh, the inclusion of people uh, whose privacy you care about. But what you eventually see is that most of the stakeholders they care about are advertisers. So there's been a lot of interaction they've had with advertisers, all of that. And in fact, um, Seda mentioned um, the role of uh, standardization bodies, for instance, W3C, where Google brought about some of their proposals, uh, which didn't go through, by the way. No one wanted to implement them, <laughs> apart from Google themselves, uh, was in some sense forced uh, by the UK's competition authority, who, again, was not really thinking about you or mine privacy. They were concerned about the advertisers who will lose business if Google gets rid of third-party cookies. But many of you here probably don't use Google Chrome. You probably use maybe Mozilla Firefox, Brave, or some other creations, all of whom have already gotten rid of third-party cookies long, long back. So why are we still talking about that? Well, Google's Chrome is essentially the market dominant player there, right? So the fact that Mozilla, even Apple, um, and uh, Brave, for instance, get rid of third-party cookies doesn't really affect the advertisers as much as if Google's Chrome gets rid of third-party cookies. And it's not only about the advertisers, right? Google makes a lot of money through, these, through this because they're not only a browser, they run operating systems, they run cloud infrastructure, they run the um, auction systems that run behind the scenes for uh, serving ads, they're everywhere. So they have a strong incentive to, to keep the essence of how they make money if and when they get rid of third-party cookies, which they've been promising, which most likely will go this year, but they have very different incentives than the other players on the market. So, when we think about third-party cookies and Google and all of this comes in, but where, where's privacy all of, in all of this? <laughs> right? It's called privacy sandbox, but where's the privacy? So the key argument, the key essence is that your browsers will not be sending personal data, which is, being, which is currently being used in auctions to serve you ads. But does that, is that the full picture? Because just because your personal data is not sent to these, what are they called, DSPs and SSPs in the whole auction system, that does not mean that you cannot be targeted. 
And that's essentially Google's claim, and that's part of the whole ecosystem they are building, to keep their surveillance business model without having to send personal data from your browsers to them. But to do this, they need multiple components. So when someone says privacy sandbox, it's not essentially like one, uh, one individual technology or something. There are plenty of application interfaces that come in. Uh, one, one example is what is, known as, what is now known as Topics API. At one point, it was known as Flock. Uh, at that point, it was the season of birds. So you had Flock, Fledge, plenty of these birds around. The idea being that your browsing data, so the websites you go, which could be various kinds of websites, could go, would play a significant role in what kind of ads you get served. So your browsing data would then be, in some sense, on your browser, by the way. So essentially, the browser is not serving you, but serving the Google and ads. It all happens on your browser. So what's going to be done is that topic is going to be, in some sense, estimated. It depends on the kinds of websites you go. If it's in, so in the top million websites, then there is a direct mapping, because this is, uh, you make a map of what kind of topics these websites serve. But if these are lesser known websites, then our fantastic tool known as machine learning comes in to estimate and predict what kind of topics you might like. Once these topics are in your browsers, your advertisers are going to check these topics and use that to serve you ads. All of this sounds super fun, right? But what could go wrong? If you're not sending personal data, it's just some topics. Let's take a small example. Imagine you're in Saudi Arabia and you're gay. The websites you go, currently they're all, so you have HTTPS and all of that, so that layer is covered. But the estimated or predicted uh, topic might be a sexual orientation. If this information gets leaked, then you're in trouble in the country you're in, right? Another aspect is who decides what topic is acceptable. There are cultural elements. So it's essentially one US firm with uh, uh, certain stakeholders who get to decide that. Even beyond this, the claim that you cannot be identified just because these, uh, your personal data is not being sent, some researchers have also questioned that particular aspect. Because if you have enough amount of this kind of data as an advertiser, you can use that with a significant probability to even identify individuals. Now, that's assuming that these advertisers don't collude, that they don't share data with each other, and also assuming that they don't have other kinds of fingerprinting metrics and all of that. Once you bring all of the other components into play, you're not that much better than today's Google Chrome. Now, all of this also is to say that you're always, in all of these uh, cases, worse off than when you're using other browsers. So your baseline is so much more important here. So that was just one particular API. There are plenty of these other components which play in. Um, there are also components that are uh, known as bundles that are being pushed. Uh, the idea being that when you visit a website, you imagine that you're being served only the content from that particular website. Imagine you go to New York Times. You think you're only getting information from New York Times. But what if New York Times or some other websites could just bundle in information from various different websites, but always serve it as if it was New York Times? So that's one of the additional proposals. And combine that with what is known as a manifest, wherein Google itself serves as the entity that's going to serve you these websites. So you imagine you're going to New York Times or some other example.com websites. That's what you see on the browsers. That's the content you get. But Google is the one who's serving you. The fact that they're serving you means they also have all this information, right? <laughs> and all of this adds up. So in a small way, it's like saying, we have the small p and the large p. Some folks have also written about it much more, where the small p privacy is like 
Well, trust us, we are Google, so we'll do everything good, and within our ecosystem, we are protected. Once you go outside, you don't have that protection. Final aspect to add here is some of these mechanisms put together need vast computational resources, and also even the minimal privacy protections that you get on top of the current Google Chrome assumes that you have millions of users. Now, both of this also kind of means that the other vendors on the market are not in a position to provide you this particular service. Right? So I'll stop at that for now. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, before we go on, I want to just check in with the audience. We're aware that sometimes we're going into technical details or maybe we're going too fast. Are there any questions, clarifications that we can pose to Chris? Anyone? Okay, that was crystal clear, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> or no one understood anything was the comment. So we'll find out in discussion. All right, Timon and Donald, go ahead. Okay, this thing? Yeah, this sounds good. Okay, so uh, the case that I am reading here today uh, is something I am empirically researching with Donald and Seda together. Um, it's called Amazon Sidewalk. Uh, it's not affiliated with Google Sidewalk, which you might know from a few years ago, uh, but it's another thing. Um, and as I say to summarize it, it's about bringing uh, connectivity to IoT devices in a crowdsourced way. And I will explain it more in a minute, but the premise of our research is that most of the literature we've seen on this covers the consequences for user privacy, because it's a crowdsourced thing, so there are certain concerns that arise. And those are very, very valid concerns, but what we think is under-researched is... Uh, how this affects manufacturers of IoT devices. So we think that Sidewalk enables Amazon to uh, reconfigure the way that value is created by these other companies in the IoT landscape. And we are looking to see if pets are instrumentalized to the, uh, in, for that purpose. So to explain what Sidewalk is, I have a slide. Uh, it could be great. Yeah, it's up here. So imagine that you have a smart mailbox that tells you when your mail has arrived, because everybody has this, right? I should clarify right at the start that this is a US-only service right now, so maybe they have it there. But the manufacturer of this mailbox wants to give connectivity to the mailbox, because if something is dropped in, then you might need to get an alert on your phone or something. And they choose to make the device sidewalk compatible, so to use sidewalk for this. The consequence is then that the mailbox does not need Wi-Fi or cellular communication or anything. It can connect to what is called a gateway, which you see as on the second spot. And the gateway is connected to the internet, so it can forward the alerts that the mailbox is sending to the network server from Sidewalk. And that is a piece that Amazon implemented to forward all the traffic, uh, make sure it's secure, and it's a functional thing. And it's part of their cloud. And then the Sidewalk network server knows which, uh, which company manufactured this mailbox, so to which application server, which is the final end, uh, it has to send the alert. And then the application server can think, okay, I received an alert from this mailbox. I have to send a message to his phone on an app or something. But that is outside of scope for now. I'm going to do it. Is he talking fast? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> so the premise here is that uh, you have an endpoint that would traditionally connect to the server from the manufacturer through maybe your own phone or through your own router. But now Amazon has inserted a gateway and a network server in between. And this is where the crowdsource part comes in, because the network server is entirely their own, uh, in their own cloud. But the gateway, that's actually gateways owned by people like you and me, or maybe not in this privacy-aware audience, but people that have bought uh, an Echo speaker, which you see at the bottom, or a Ring camera doorbell. Those devices uh, were reconfigured with the software update back in 2021 to share part of their bandwidth with this network, right? So if the mailbox did not have connectivity, then post this 21, 2021 update, it could connect to these other gateways using the sidewalk protocol. And now you may expect this is where the privacy concerns come in, right? Uh, this is where we see organizations like the EFF and also researchers say, okay, if my endpoint talks to your gateway, talks to Amazon's cloud, and then it only gets to the manufacturer server, then People can see my data, maybe, or can tamper with it, and we want to prevent that. So this is where Amazon uses their pets. So there are three layers of encryption, and they use some obfuscation uh, to hide the identity of these devices. And the consensus is that this works more or less, so they address the privacy concerns. 
And yeah, we can also assume that that is the case here. But this is where our research takes a manufacturer focus. So it's important to assess whether these pets work to which extent. But we are also seeing manufacturers becoming more dependent on Amazon's cloud if they make their devices sidewalk compatible. And a second point we see, uh, which is more hypothetical, but I will elaborate on it in a bit, uh, is that Amazon becomes kind of a, a network provider and they can see how all these IoT devices interact with the cloud. And because of that, they can learn how the devices work and more effectively compete with IoT companies. So I'll start with the point uh, about IoT companies becoming more dependent on Amazon. If you want to make your device sidewalk compatible, uh, it uses Bluetooth or LoRa, which is a long range technology under the hood. So you need to implement certain chips and uh, you also need to secure it in a way. And for both things, you need Amazon. So Amazon has partnered with some silicon providers and you can only use their chips in your devices. Then once your prototype is done, you have to get it approved by Amazon. Then once your prototype is finally working, all the data goes through AWS. And they have a very neat service in AWS where you can process the data and manage your sidewalk devices. But if you don't want to use that, if you want to use another cloud, then you have to pull the data out of AWS and then ingest it wherever you want. So there's an extra hurdle. And yeah, we see all these extra barriers that Amazon is putting up, uh, deliberately or not, maybe for the sake of technology or security, that makes it harder for manufacturers to develop their products outside of Amazon's web services. So that's our first concern. It looks like it's just a pipe, maybe, connecting the endpoint to the server, but they are doing much more. They are connecting the endpoint to their cloud, and meanwhile, they are kind of funneling manufacturers to also use their cloud for all their other services. Second point, and I'll be more brief on this. Um, it's hypothetical. We are doing more research to see what data Amazon can see. But because they own this network server in the middle that is fully in AWS, they can see how these devices operate. And the payload, so the content of what the mailbox sends, that is encrypted, so you don't have to worry about that. But we've spoken to IoT manufacturers of sidewalk devices, and we've looked into their documentations, and Amazon can still see how often a device operates with the cloud, uh, from where, what the brand is of each device, uh, what size the payload is, so they can learn a lot about how these devices use the cloud, and then use that to improve their own IoT devices, maybe. And like I said, it's still hypothetical, but you might remember that Amazon also has a marketplace and they tend to look at products that are in high demand and then copy aspects of them for their own Amazon basic brand. And that's also something we've heard manufacturers worry about. So it's a bit skewed in our opinion. There is a power asymmetry because for Amazon, it's very clearly in line with their revenue generating activities. But for the manufacturers, it's a bit more messy. So they invest all these resources and all these efforts to actually become more dependent with Amazon, but they have to adopt special chips and yeah, have to get all this knowledge on board on how you interact with AWS. And okay, you may think, well, what's the big deal? Because they get connectivity in return, right? So it's a service, you have to invest something for it. But some of the manufacturers we spoke to actually said that the connectivity that they get is not really the decisive factor to join Sidewalk. They're more interested in uh, just doing business with Amazon because Amazon is so big Companies rely on them also for their cloud, their logistics maybe, their marketplace. One interviewee said that they were simply befriending the giant and for that reason working with Amazon in this space. And it's a quite novel service. So Amazon also invited some of these companies to be their guinea pig. And these companies apparently agree to it because they want to keep Amazon as their friend. And meanwhile, they are making themselves more dependent on them also. So that's where we think there is a power asymmetry. And then they are both making themselves more dependent and putting Amazon in a powerful competitive position because they can potentially see all this data about how the devices work. So that's, why, that's how we see pets being instrumentalized. Because all of this relies on gateways of ordinary people, gateways that were already in people, their homes, being reconfigured with a software update that was an opt-out basis, of course. And because of that opt-out nature, or I cannot say because, but I think there is some overlap. They published the update on an opt-out basis, and now they claim they cover 90% of the US population with this network. So I think we can infer how many people found that button. And that's how we think pets are being instrumentalized by Amazon in this case.
much more important than the payload data. Uh, and we take a close look at this. You mentioned already that the metadata is what uh, the manufacturers mentioned that, uh, of course, Amazon can see how often what is transmitted, something is transmitted from where and so on. Is there some research going on in, in this, how much metadata Amazon uses? Yes, exactly. That's something we are researching. Um, so we are working with colleagues in Spain at the MDEA Institute uh, to see what data these devices generate, right? Uh, we also looked into the specifications they have of the protocol, which says uh, you have to format your data in this and this way, and you can interpret this variable like this. So that's how we got the hints of what I said, that they can look at uh, coverage, for example, or how often it communicates. But that is ongoing research, yes. Any other clarification questions? All right, Carmela, you're on. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, Timon and Donald asked me to talk about my experience with the contact tracing apps, uh, for which I was a main designer for the protocols, right? And all of this started back in 2020. If you remember, there was a pandemic. It was a whole hoo ha. And early in the beginning, uh, some people decided that technology could help and it would be a good idea to have some technology interventions, especially to help with what is called contact tracing to stop chains of infection. What happened is as COVID was so fast and growing so quickly that traditional methods became very inefficient. We didn't have enough people to actually talk with the people that were getting infected, gather the data about who they could have infected and actually contact those people. So technology kind of seemed like a good solution. And at that point, because we needed to deploy this technology very fast, there was no time to kind of build something from scratch. And the idea is, OK, we can use the sensor that everybody has, which is a smartphone. So with this came a lot of issues. I actually got Seda, called Seda, Michael Veal, to ask them. Yeah, I called her, I was like, hey, can I just a small question? I just need a 10 minutes of your time. And then we ended up for almost two years working on this kind of daily. And what Seda remembers is the longest call of her life. Um, but what was interesting about this um, is that when we were brought into this project, and I was brought there kind of by serendipity, by BMI expertise on privacy, the solution that kind of was on the table was on the privacy side. It was already privacy preserving. But what we observed is that that privacy preserving solution in which there was a lot of, oh, there are only random identifiers moving around and there are no identities and all is good, actually was very reconfigurable. The way in which this private data was collected, it would allow this infrastructure to actually be used for different things, for monitoring, for targeting, Right? And this idea of purpose limitation that said it was in the beginning was extremely hard to enforce technologically. We could only rely on policy and policies to do this thing, but we all know that when policies are the only thing within maybe law enforcement and data, it doesn't always work that well. So kind of we made a big effort in actually creating a system and you may remember this as a very kind of privacy-oriented battle because privacy was the word we were using because it's the word that kind of the public relates to. But at the core of our design, it was purpose limitation. It was the idea we want to create something that can only do one thing and cannot be changed later on and reused. Uh, the success of our plan is not only shown in the fact that, well, this was deployed, la la la, very nice is on the fact that, do you know where these apps are now? Have you ever heard of them anymore? No, they were so good at doing only one thing that the moment the thing was not needed anymore, they disappeared from the face of Earth. Very different from any other apps that you have that you install them on your phone and then you know they grow and expand and expand and just take over your lives. <laughs> so that's what we did. And at that point, well, Google and Apple actually kind of agreed with our philosophy. It was interesting and it was nice because at that point then that became very powerful. You had both the experts and the tech companies saying this is the way to go. But what was kind of a surprise to me about that is that, well, they said, okay, in order to really warranty privacy and that this data cannot be reused, instead of just allowing people to um, implement the protocol themselves, we're going to implement the protocol at the operative systems level. And this is very similar to what Chris was saying of, uh, well, 
in privacy sandbox. They're going to implement a lot of these topics and whatever at the, well, in this case, it's at the browser level, but the browser is an operative system for all that we care nowadays, right? It's the thing that does everything for you. Or inside what we also have this cloud and this service that kind of implements a bunch of stuff on the big tech side. And they did this in the name of privacy to just make sure that we're all protected. But when you implement something in the operative system, of course, we programmers don't have right to access that directly. The operative system is theirs. That means that they need to put uh, what we call an API, an interface, to allow you to interact with their functionalities. And this is where the power comes in, because now they decide how you're going to interact with this. And they decided a set of functionalities that they decided it was good enough based on basically their assets on one day, yeah, talking Cupertino with the other guys in Silicon Valley, like you think is good. And they were like, yeah, this is good. Um, and they implemented that thing, right? And then off we go because that's what you have now. And if you want to implement, you have to implement on top of this. This you have to think uh, is very similar to in topics. Right? They make a decision, as Chris was saying, it's not about which topics are acceptable. They will make a decision of which are the topics, what is the fine grain, which are the kind of things that they will learn or not learn. They will essentially decide how to define us, right? Which kind of keywords can define any human on earth is going to be purely decided on whatever person in, uh, at Google decides this is good based on probably their us again or they talk with somebody that is there. Um, and Amazon, right, we're going to see the same thing in which which services or what kind of interactions these endpoints can do with the cloud is going to be defined by whatever Amazon decides. This is the functionality that I consider okay or not okay. And this thing, the interesting part, is that suddenly make Google and Apple become a entity on the table. At that point, I was kind of helping Switzerland, that's the country where I live, where my university is, and we were kind of helping the Swiss government as the tech experts to take part in, this, uh, in these discussions. And I ended up in a lot of discussions, especially in the European Union with members of other countries and of these tech teams and Google and Apple. And they had a lot of power here on actually talking and saying, well, the moment that they decided something is not possible, they said, we're not going to do it. And good luck to you telling them. We had, uh, it was interesting that we had a lot of very cultural clashes on them making decisions based on how the US works, which yes, there is a lot of states. So the kind of thing that Europe is the same, because we have a lot of states. <laughs> yeah, right? And we're like, no, like we're not the same. We don't have same cultures, we don't have same laws, we don't have anything, right? Like this is such a different world. And we had a lot of issues on that matter, but the important things that they were at the table. They were at the table, then we were making decisions. They decided exactly what was the definition of privacy we could implement. They decided when and how was the utility that we could implement. Not only they decided that, they decided when to change it. And they could change it under your feet with no problem, right? Like from day to another, your app stops working and you're just like, uh huh. And they were like, yeah, yeah, we decided that it was better. And this was like, to me, it was a surprise, right? I didn't realize how much power they had when we were operating on the operative system. Uh, back then, we were working with app developers that they just do a lot of apps, like that's their business. And I asked them, is this normal? And they were like, yeah. And I'm like, and what do you do when they do this thing, right? And they change all the time. It's like we, we went over, right? There's one phone, that's the place. Um, people, the user is not aware that Google is on the other side making changes. They use an app, the app stops working, they write to us and they are annoyed. Right? And it is the business of the app developers and the app developers need to work with Google very fast and do whatever Google says because they don't have time to fight back. They don't have that power. And again, we see this power. They have the power. They have the power to tell developers what to do. They have the power to kind of tell countries what to do inside the public infrastructure, right? I mean, they also have the power in the case of topics to decide what, how advertising moves. And again, think not only about or like how much private information we can have, but just how much power you can have when you're going to decide how people are defined. And if you want to move commerce to one particular sector, you just take your stream of topics and just change it, right? You just change the distribution, and that would actually change what is sold, what is not sold, what is presented to people. 
And we see the, in this, and we will see this all the time. So at the end of the day, this, this kind of tools, and they use a lot this privacy and security to decide that some part of the functionality, it is better. It is better for you guys if they put it in the operative system because that will make it more secure, more privacy preserving, but that also means that they're gaining power every time because when they're gonna define this line between what you can do with the thing in the operative system or not, they're gonna make decisions that will affect how we can interact with each other. And that is really what um, this privacy or privacy technologies will bring and bring their power. It's not about how much information they have about us or not about, well, they can sell us better or not. It's the fact that they're going to decide how and when things can be sold and who and when can sell these things. And that is, is really one of the problems when we just think about information leaks and what information can have, and we stop looking at how does that really change and where does this put this technology, this big tech, in the world of how we interact with each other. Thank you. Any clarifications for Carmela? Any clarification questions? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for that. My, my name is Terence Eden. I worked on the UK contact tracing app. Um, we started without the Google Apple system and we, we built our own. Um, and it very quickly became apparent that it, it couldn't work as well as an OS level one. So I, I suppose my question to you is, was it worth it? Was it worth switching to, uh, you know, switching to Google and Apple who aren't necessarily as privacy protecting versus doing it ourselves, which may have been less effective for its purpose? Um, I think... <laughs> I think that at that point, yes, I think it was better, it was kind of necessary. I think that as I, it surfaced a lot of these problems in a very visible way, which is good. It didn't create further harm. They try actually to monetize or whatever thing, some more stuff because they wanted to create some more privacy preserving statistics to sell to people. Uh, in Europe, people immediately told them, what? Um, in the US, it worked a little bit better, but it didn't really work, right? They couldn't really get to the place that they wanted. And it's a lot, I think because they pissed off a lot of people by, by kind of crossing, closing this thing and people realized very fast that they were just losing the power. Um, and I think that at that point, maybe, yes, it was useful because indeed we could have implemented this on our own and probably some countries would really have abided to this protocol and to this kind of idea, but many others would end up kind of using that information. So we're in a kind of a, in a pickle here, right? Because now either we trust them to close this or not. In that particular thing, especially with the speed, I mean, one of the main problems here is that we had to deploy at the speed of light, right? We produce, we did a whole cycle from conception to development in a month. Like, this is not agile. It's like <laughs> speed of light shit that you don't know how happened. So at that point, there is not much time to reflect. There is not that much time to put safeguards. So I think in a way that kind of, didn't play badly, but the fact that the design was so restrictive yeah, uh, technologically kind of also ensured to us that even though they got a seat at the table, they were also very limited in what they could do. And, and yeah, I mean, in all of the bad things, again, probably was the best thing. Imagine that we could have gone through the other way of thing, and then they would have all of these identifiers on a data center where they could have run, right? So I still think that in all of the evils, this was the minimal evil we could have. Uh, yeah, it was perfect. No, but I, at the point where people were like, we're gonna implement this shit on a phone, whether you like it or not, I think that's the best outcome that we could ever have. And as I said, the proof to me, a lot of people ask me, aren't you sad that these things are not there? It's like, no, this is a perfect proof that we did a good job. This is a moment where we can just take questions from the audience. Um, great, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you. That was very insightful. Um, how do we make our democracies then more robust against this kind of digital power grab for the next crisis? 
<laughs> so I think I think that one of the things that have to come here to and I don't know if this is about the crisis or not. Like crises are very different moments, and crises are very dangerous moments. Like we were saying now, right? The, the push that happened, and also how much society will accept stuff. Like at that point, I mean, I'm Spanish, and Spain was super restrictive. Like people were at home, like locked with their kids, and they would have taken anything to go to the street. So crises are very, but but I don't think that we can solve problems at crisis. We have to problem solve them before. And I think one of the main messages that that uh, at least I hope come out from this panel is that privacy is very important, but we need to check about which privacy. Like big tech has hijacked the term to mean like we don't look at your information instead of checking that actually privacy helps preventing harms, whether they are due to private information leaks, like the kind of things that um, Chris was describing, or they are much deeper harms to our democracy in terms of letting them come in. And kind of the hard thing here is that these two problems are solved in different ways. Like one of them is more kind of in the GDPR side, the other one is more in the antitrust. And it is interesting that these two things are to touch with each other. Even though the activists and the policymakers that work on them, they are very different, now we see more and more how they get entangled. And I think how we protect democracy is by maybe shifting a little bit all of this privacy thing that the European bureaucrats nowadays love to have in their mouth, like this privacy preserving is good, to actually move back to does this solve a problem, does this create a harm, how does it harm our democracy? Because you can have private things that harm your democracy. So changing the discourse, uh, I think, is very important to actually bring back the democracy discussion rather than staying at this privacy level, which um, hides many things. Any other takers? Yeah. Also, just to always emphasize that often the privacy and the data protection discourse goes together. Uh, but we need also think that even when your data is protected, your privacy could still be harmed. That's, I think, in some sense, for a lot of people, a bit counterintuitive because of the current discourse, but I think that's, that's one thing we should always keep in mind. Yes, data is protected, fantastic, we are very happy, but is our privacy also being protected? Donald? Hello. Yeah, so um, uh, in the case of Sidewalk, um, the case that we were studying, um, so I'm speaking as a person trained in economics and usually we don't um, investigate technical systems and for example in our case we saw how privacy can actually expand infrastructural power by um, you know like through a single uh, software update basically agile software development you can change devices you don't need to acquire companies anymore to get more information right because like that's the economic thinking. You need to acquire uh, other companies in order to um, to know what they're doing or to assimilate more information into your operations. But then um, Sidewalk is very incredible because you don't need acquisitions and mergers, right? Um, and this is, you know, like mergers and acquisitions, they usually uh, target this in competition law and in antitrust. But then um, what if devices can be turned into assets by Amazon, right, through um, this case that we were studying. So there are a lot of uh, market theories that are not anymore holding true. And, you know, uh, we don't even know whether supply and demand is working in the digital economy and how to study that. Um, so, for example, what is a market um, in the Amazon sidewalk case? Is it market for cloud computing? Is it market for more device? more services that will run um, in your devices, who has power in this kind of ecosystem that seems to be closed and, you know, that incentivizes manufacturers to expand Amazon's infrastructural control while at the same time, you know, um, experimenting with new technologies so that we would pay for more and more subscription services in the future because, like, this is how they make money. And, you know, we touched on the financialization aspect of this a while ago. So a lot of questions about um, competition and privacy and how they go together. Um, I think that's very interesting also because um, I think in Carmela and Chris's case, 
we see that um, companies are not anymore just producing stuff. They're becoming arbiters of privacy and, you know, uh, they're making decisions for us. So um, it's not just a market question or like, um, it's a question of who makes the market, not who plays in the market, right? That's great. And I think that just to conclude very quickly, digital rights frame does look at individual protection. And if they check the privacy functionality, then there's very little left to actually criticize the expansion of their infrastructure, which includes taking over our devices, right? Because all of the examples, if you've noticed, is about expanding the infrastructure, the services they developed onto our devices and in the process of reconfiguring our devices and using privacy to do so. Um, so if we just stick with digital rights, we might not have sufficient grounds upon which to both um, see, study, and critique, and change the current um, way things are going. And I think that's a really big challenge to this community that I hope becomes clear through the panel. Did you want to? Um, th thanks so much for, I think your final comment sort of ties in a, a question that I had across, and I really appreciate you mentioning the, the, the book that I added in, edited in your introduction, and I think one of the things that I want to pose to everyone is, given that um, the expansion of, of infrastructural control and how it's only in the hands of a number of companies, breaks so many things, right? It breaks our approach to privacy activism and the chapter you mentioned in the book by Michael Veal, he makes a very clear call on, on many people in the room here who consider themselves to be privacy activists by saying, we need to reframe what that means because it's very easy to think that you're an activist working on privacy, but in the long run, because of this computational infrastructural power, you actually end up um, cementing the power of big tech by doing that. And um, I was wondering what, each of you could say also about the business-to-business -business, uh, aspects of this, which is generally something the civil or the digital rights uh, community is not always as focused on because it is hard to see. So given that so many assumptions about how we do good advocacy are broken by the, by the work that you all do, do you have some advice on like how to pick up on these issues in a way that we can actually make a change while also being willing to let go of some of our no longer functioning uh, theories of change around how to be good activists in this space? I'd say the first starting point would be not to put ourselves in silos. And so if you're a digital rights activist, great, but we should also be talking to the folks who are working on the competition side of things, on the consumer protection side of things, because all of this interacts and the more we see and treat them as silos, we are giving more power to those who are running these infrastructures because they're essentially running on top of that, right? They're very happy as long as we complain only about data protection or privacy and someone else is complaining about consumer protection or competition, they just treat them as separate problems and deal with them separately and they're very happy. They're like, yay, see, we solved your problem. We solved your problem. So, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second would be to also link all of this and look at other stakeholders uh, in, the, um, in the market, for instance. So I mentioned like the Google Sandbox case, a lot of the stakeholders who were consulted and all of it were advertisers, but there were plenty of small businesses out there who were complaining. Their was, the voices weren't really heard, so they were just drowned, right? So we need to think about potential industry side uh, alliances as well. Uh, it's not all industry bad, right? So <laughs> there are plenty of wonderful businesses out there as well, so that's the other thing. Um, and also to see the cross-functionality. I spoke primarily of Google Sandbox as a browser thing, but there's also the privacy sandbox for Android, which is coming up and being developed. And as Carmela mentioned, browser is essentially like an operating system these days in how people use it. And Google knows this, right? So they develop something as a tool for first as browser and then move it into the uh, operating system side of things because, hey, they also control operating system here. Right? So it's the whole stack, uh, and as competition folks would think about, think both vertical stack and horizontal, right? Both ways. If you miss one of the axes, then you're missing the bigger picture. 
Um, so first, one little parenthesis, just for those that not use Chrome and then they say they're out of this. Um, Chris mentioned before manifest. Manifest is how Google says that interactions should happen with the browser. And once Google does that, what happens is that most website providers, they don't have the, pa the capacity to do many. So they just work for the manifest of uh, Google and Apple. And that means that that gets actually trickled down through Safari, Brave, Opera, Firefox. So if you think that if you're in Firefox, you're out of there, no. Like they still rule what you're going to do. Anyway, for your question, what I have found helped me, like this DP3T contact tracing adventure was really kind of a shock in a lot of things that I was doing, including this shift that Seta says from moving from this data minimization to purpose limitation. So I think that's the key thing as privacy advocates that we have to do, right, to move from this idea that if you don't have the data or if we can, um, like in very technical terms, we move from information flows we need to move to this purpose limit, to this repurposing, to the idea of what kind of thing you can do. And the other thing I have found very helpful also when I go and give talks in places is to bring up the definition, the, this article, the right to privacy from the, the Human Rights Declaration. Apparently we have forgotten to ever look at it back and let big tech hijack the term privacy as this information flow. Because if you go and read that article, the article doesn't say you have the right to people not knowing your information. It says you have the right for people not to intervene in your life. And when we change that thing, this intervention, then, and we go back to that definition, then a lot of the problems just come, right? And you have not changed anything. You can even not need to change privacy. We just need to reclaim the term as the thing that it always was. Privacy is not an end. And make, allowing these people to convert it into an end has brought the problems. Privacy is a means. It was always a means to protect yourself. That's how we use privacy in the offline world. When you don't tell things, like already when you were a teenager and you didn't tell your parents about where you were going, it was not a question of, oh, I want my privacy. It's a question, you don't want them to forbid you to go to the mall to kiss your partner, right? It's not, a, it's, you're kind of, the consequence is the thing that you're, you're protecting with privacy. And the moment that we forgot that part, that I think, and I, again, I think that changing a little bit this discourse, which is not very far and should not be that difficult, but the slowly, slowly moving from, we need to protect the data to we need to protect from harms, from intervention, go back to the basics, and that should actually help a lot in, in kind of changing this, this discourse and kind of removing the meaning that they have given to it. Because if you can do the harm while still not having the data, then your privacy technology is essentially a <coughs> privacy washing bullshit. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, so to add on to that you said that privacy is being hijacked, uh, I can relate to that as a researcher. Um, so I started, uh, or at the start of the research into Sidewalk, uh, we looked into the documents that Amazon put out and their announcements. And the announcements would usually go like, we have Sidewalk, it's crowdsourced, so we have a lot of coverage. You can do this and this and this awesome thing with it, and you don't have to worry about the privacy. And then came a privacy and security white paper that I think mentioned the word privacy less than five times. I'm not sure how often, but it was only about the security and the pets they put in place. So like you said, they are marketing it as a privacy thing, while it only goes into keeping your data confidential. And then there was some, uh, they also defended the opt-out mechanism, by saying we constrain how much bandwidth is used and it's very secure. But the question of whether you want your device to contribute to something that creates value for Amazon, that's not addressed. And uh, I think like Chris said, it's also very important to see how other smaller companies are affected. So what I learned in interviewing uh, these Sidewalk adopting companies about the industry dynamics and the reasons to adopt Sidewalk because they wanted to prevent the giants, I'm not sure you're gonna find that anything I'm not sure you can find that anywhere else without talking to these other companies in the competitive space. And if I can just quickly add, um, just to respond, I think what we learned from this, these examples is that we can't just analyze the design of the technology to figure out what are the digital rights or policy issues. And when I say design, I'm, in popular policy talk, I'm talking about algorithms or AI, and they're going to do harms or apps in some cases. What we're seeing is that it's not only the algorithm that is doing harm to individuals directly, 
right? It's not just about B2C, but these infrastructures are putting a new economic and political order in place, both reshuffling business to business ecosystems and changing the relationship between business to governments, that's what we saw in Carmela's case. That means inequalities, questions of social, economic, racial justice are going to arise not because of how the algorithm was decide, designed or how AI works or how the app is designed. That will also happen, but it will especially happen because of this new economic and political order. So don't just focus on the algorithm and say we made it fair or we made it privacy preserving and what have you. Look at the new political economic order put in place. Who's going to suffer from that? Who has more power? Are we going to see more consolidation of businesses because they can't fight against these bigger powers? Are governments going to bend because they continue to summon these infrastructures for public health or for education and what have you? So I think we need to keep that bigger lens in mind and be really careful. Anything that is correction of algorithms is the metier of big business. That is what they do best. So if you try to correct design, they will always come and say, we'll do it best. Okay, so that's kind of my last words on that. Okay, more questions. And maybe, um, how much more time do we have? We, we started about 10 minutes late. So how much time do we have? 15, okay, should I take questions in twos so that um, we hear more questions? Because that's, we've been talking a lot. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for the for the great panel. I missed the first part. Sorry for that. Um, I, I noticed that we're talking mostly about the business side, how big tech instrumentalizes privacy to expand its infrastructural power. I have the feeling that we're we are sort of not looking at the governmental side of it, and specifically, I'm looking at like upcoming regulations and ideas around uh, uh, electronic identity, digital euro, where Basically, the same kind of like infrastructural dimension takes place and where government creates a similar, expands its power, I feel. Um, does the panel have any ideas or comments on that? And also, does the panel have any ideas on, and this is coming back to what Ina was saying, what, what can we do? How can we especially help these policymakers in making better decisions in that respect? My question relates more to what kind of conclusions we should draw when um, we apply um, what we learn here. Um, so I, I want to give an example from practice. I helped a couple of friends of mine who um, wanted to unionize the delivery drivers of uh, food delivery apps during the pandemic in my home city of Vienna. and. They ran into quite a bit of difficulties because somehow their employers always knew where they were and when they met and they were unexpectedly fired from their positions uh, just because they hung out in their spare time. <laughs> um, so uh, they went to switching phones and leaving their phones at home when they were off, off the job and meeting and using apps like Telegram and stuff to communicate with each other. And um, of course, they shifted dependencies to, like, uh, like you described today, like they, they took conscious steps to become more private, but they shifted dependencies to other tech companies, whoever, you know, like, um, so, but when I listen to you, like the, when we, got, when we lift it to the policy level, it, becomes very frustratingly slow, right? Because uh, uh, the landscape changes so fast and um, we're still waiting for regulation. So do you have advice on like, uh, the, like the technical level or like practical steps that activists can take in order to improve their situation? Be because I'm, I'm all with you that uh, on, the, on the policy side, we should take care and pay attention into not allowing infrastructure to monopolize in private hands, okay? But uh, apart from that, what else can we do? Thank you. Uh, if I can have an additional question on that one. Yes. Uh, because I was thinking, uh, uh, when you mentioned all the, the control and the Internet of Things world is going to be monopolized by the big tech, so we have all the digital acts out there in Europe that uh, a lot of them try to organize that and try to 
minimize that, that negative uh, impact. Any ideas on will it work or not? Okay, so the Yap Hank, I mean, he said 15 minutes, okay, so to go about how we're gonna do with the EIDAS and the, all of this crap. Um, so, uh, maybe say what AIDAS is. Uh, EIDAS is the, the electronic digital identity regulation. So, to me, there is a, lit, a lot of conflict in there because privacy in there cannot really help with a lot of purpose limitation and kind of limitation of this infrastructure, which indeed doesn't matter how much privacy we put in, it still makes a shift of power because now it will create the need to have an ID that I can only give to you. I will only give you the attributes I want when I want them based on the criteria of I decide on my government and will accentuate this difference of power. And there is no privacy that can help. I think it's a good, a good example of this. So again, I think that maybe changing, and, and this discourse is gonna be very hard to change because it's not something that the main public are gonna feel affected by because the main public does, will have the attributes they want, right? So how do we make that? And how do we make this difference? I think, I think that one is very hard. I have been thinking now for a lot of months, uh, yeah, in the fight with the IAIDAS and what do we do and where to position ourselves or myself as I can make it more privacy preserving. We can, we have technology to make it very good, but is that a good idea? Because maybe then we're just kind of legitimizing a tool that shouldn't exist. I don't have a good answer. I think that a very important thing is to make this more vocal, these ideas, Again, shift the discussion from privacy is good to is the technology good? Will it help our democracy? How does it help? Who does it help? And the, what I find the very hard part is how to get journalists to pick on this because they want to just ask me, can you track people on the internet with the ID? And I was like, yeah, dude, this is not important. I mean, this is important, yeah, sure. But there are so many things behind. And, and I find, I think that can be one of the main tools. Um, also from my experience in the tracing apps, a lot of it came from public opinion. At the end of the day, politicians need to be re-elected. So kind of getting this information back to the public so that they feel it and they have an opinion, I think is one of the main tools we have. I don't know how to do it. Um, so if you have ideas about that. Um, for the other question about how do we help activists, I think this is a very different kind of story, right? With um, did you get more dependent on these technologies? Well, it is true that the big tech the giants are going to decide whether Telegram or Signal can live on their platforms. But messenger apps are actually one of the few things where we still have quite some autonomy to, to decide how and when things exist. Now, most of them are quite commercial and they need to live through commercial things. So. They're not gonna be as protective for activists as we want. Maybe we should have need a messenger for activists. My group actually started to work with some teams about this. What is different about what they would like? Signal is doing a pretty good job in some of those things. But yeah, there is nothing that will prevent you from needing a second phone, right? Um, I don't know how to solve that problem. That is the thing that you're gonna do. But I think that these, these two topics kind of are, are a bit unrelated in a way of how do we help that case. And I think that a main thing again is about information. How do we help activists? How do we help people to understand the dangers of the phone earlier before they get fired? And that's again, I'm very happy to talk offline. I don't want to take the phone more time about how do we do that? And for your question, I have no idea. <laughs> um, maybe it's just about the policy question. Um, slow policy. Uh, um, I think um, at some point, like our frameworks should, uh, I mean, we should look for other frameworks because right now we introduce infrastructural power, which I think isn't in policies yet. Like they usually think about network effects, those kinds of the standard economic understandings that are that get inscribed in law, right? Um, but then if for example, um, there's a lot of concern about data and policing data flows. But then if you look at the sidewalk case, then you ask, like, should, not, should we now think about purpose limitation for devices and not only data that, 
that passes through them because Amazon can actually just, you know, update your devices and then make it part of a network protocol for its, you know, for, you know, business making and opening up to developers to produce more services, which we haven't, it's, it's hard to study the externalities of those because like for other people, they say, oh, good, we have more services and therefore, you know, we're more productive. But then, um, like, what is the assumption behind that? And how does that impact privacy or notions of privacy? Is it now just consumer facing? Like, you know, the um, when we read the news, privacy always seems to be about consumer facing stuff. And then we introduce now that there is something about B2B and privacy that we haven't discussed yet in detail. And maybe um, policymakers should focus on that because that's kind of a blind side uh, right now. Um, yeah, so like for example, there is the assumption that if consumer data is protected, if you um, uh, protect the confidentiality and integrity of data, then they assume that there's no harm to consumers, which is, you know, maybe there's no privacy harm because your data will not be leaked. But then if this data um, becomes pulled together to make new services, maybe there are economic harms that we are not seeing. And actually in our research group, we're some of the studies are about that, right? Like the economic harms and not just discrimination harms or misinformation harms. Like there are other harms that reside not only in the social sphere, but maybe political, economic. Like um, how do we now set prices for these uh, services? Who gets a say as to, you know, whether or not these, the pricing of these digital services are competitive or not? We, we don't have tools for that actually in economics. So things to think about I just add that uh, with the question about all these acts uh, so one of the acts I worked on more is the AI regulation and the key question always comes up is the regulation is written in a way where the solution is always technical right technology will save you right like detect bias mitigate bias if the state of the art is not good enough you're still fulfilling and you're fine with the regulation Right. The assumption being that what is going on should still keep going on, but we'll do all these checks and the regulations just to make sure that you're ticking the box and you're like, okay, great, we've done it. State of the art doesn't prevent bias because, well, it's not only a technical problem. So it's okay, you keep continuing, keep continuing using it. And so that's in some sense a place where we need to rethink from a policy space, right? Or get this into the people who are writing the policies that just because we do these tick boxes, that doesn't change. Sometimes you need to really think harder about the business models and all of this and all the combinations of these things, not individual components. Right? So that's probably one place where I will think we should be. So it doesn't directly answer your question, but that's the way I would be thinking about it. Um, as you go with the microphone, I'll just quickly pick up on the activist. Um, one of the things we've been trying to do is to work with activists and communities to ask them about their experience of infrastructural power instead of asking about the typical, you know, um, fairness or privacy or whatever the, um, the highlights have been in the past also in digital rights spaces. And it's really fascinating, I think, um, in some of our work, we make this kind of provocative thing where we say, okay, these companies, these computational infrastructures are controlled environments that are being optimized where the laborers are actually uh, collateral damage, right? So they're not necessarily in the old kind of Tayloristic mode of optimizing workers as much as they're optimizing their environment and within that labor gets squeezed. So how can we mobilize labor not to just ask for labor to be considered better in an environment that is continuously going to be optimized and squeeze them anyways, to having them read the environment for us so that we can understand infrastructural power and where we can push back on it. And so that's a very different question. We've been doing some of this work with the Institute for Technology and the Public Interest. And it's really fascinating if you switch the question, like how does your exact, your uh, environment, how does your institutional relationship, how do your um, so to say, everyday life change as a result of this digitalization and the infrastructure, we get very different answers than privacy and surveillance, just as a tip. Okay. Um, yeah, so I also wanted to add that I think that uh, big tech often uses privacy and safety as a lobbying talking point. We saw it, for instance, during the 
Digital Markets Act that Apple was going around basically saying that if we do open up the App Store or uh, the mobile operating system, that basically, yeah, all hell will break loose and we cannot protect you anymore. And they did actually get that as a win. There is a softening of the um, final rule because of that. Um, but I think that basically where we are coming to is that we have to address power. And if we don't actually destroy the power that these companies have over specific markets, we will continuously be trying to catch up and trying to protect our rights in very limited ways and actually protect democracy as well. Um, so I think we've already, you've already mentioned that we have to align the privacy activists with the antitrust activists. Um, but maybe I would like you to comment a little bit more of what the scope or the possibility is in the antitrust. And maybe I also wanted to ask, what do you think um, about also industri industrial policy, whether we don't actually also have to build the alternatives and build some public utilities that are actually more democratically controlled and that could get us off the dependency of, for instance, the cloud. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you for a great yeah. panel. <laughs> um, yeah, sort of my question relates to some of the questions before, and, and you've elaborated a bit already, and especially Corinne's question of theories of change. Like, in the face of this massive complicity of governments in the issues you described, there seems to be little hope in the law at all uh, to, to, to really structurally change any of this. Um, you mentioned, indeed, Carmela, uh, uh, awareness raising, uh, I guess, more work and research on like exposing uh, these issues properly. Um, I was wondering what role there is for, uh, for sabotage, perhaps, and I was thinking also of, of Seda's work on uh, POTS. Like, is there any, uh, I don't know if she's hearing me, <laughs> if there's any uh, follow-up on the work you've been doing, Seda, on, on POTS? Uh, to to challenge uh, these these issues that you're talking about, and perhaps applied in the in the specific case studies. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, that is working. Um, hi, uh, Mark from Article 19. It's it's very refreshing to hear economics market power mentioned within the confines of these events. And I actually just wanted to give a shout out to a report. That SOMO, who Margarita works for, she just spoke there, on Amazon and independent sellers and market power. So as an introduction to the power that Amazon has, both vertically and horizontally, it's an excellent report. And, and I recommend it to everything, or to everyone, I should say. And that's my statement rather than my question. Thank you. Simeon from Patrick Breyer's team. Uh, so it seems that many of the issues related to pets that we have discussed uh, have a societal aspect more or equal to the individual aspect. But it seems that we, we kind of lack a legal and practical framework for recognize these harms and address them. Um, data protection and privacy have tended to have an individu individu individualistic focus. Sorry while competition, perhaps the other side, is more societally focused. So do we have any way of addressing these, quote unquote, societal harms that we have been discussing other than through antitrust slash competition law? And should we develop one, if at all? I think one of the root problems here is the lack of control over our personal devices. So it used to be called a personal computer and I think you don't need to have the conversation anymore. But it ties, uh, it relates to multiple things. So we are speaking about uh, antitrust and competition law, but I have a very basic understanding of it. I'll start with that. But uh, as far as I know, you have to define a market and define where you want to intervene, right? And with the sidewalk example, I think Maybe they were inventing something new. So I'm not sure if you could catch up with competition law. So you would have to then, like Donald said before, come up with new frameworks. So how do you, how do you assess that something is wrong, in your opinion? And can you maybe tie that to the lack of personal control? So 
Sidewalk relies on being crowdsourced, which was on an opt-out basis. Maybe there is something you can interview there. And then not saying that opt-out is harmful from a data protection perspective, but more from having control over your device in general. And I think we're limited for time, so I'll stick with that. We have two minutes. Um, so, honestly, I think maybe trying to address your question, I'm not very sure that I can. So the, the idea of the, can we build an alternative? So my experience, if there are kind of two ways of beating like kind of the things that are common, in the contact tracing apps, we did that by actually providing an alternative, right? And that was the win, because we could say, okay, we can get the benefits without the harms, and that worked. In the case of chat control, what we actually did was push on chat control has no benefits, so the harms overweight, right? So these are the kind of two ways, and it's not because it's not always possible to actually build the alternative. And indeed, it would be very interesting to think about how would an alternative that is acceptable look like. In the case of chat control, there is none, right? And it took a while to actually find, and, and there was a lot of work with Edri actually on how do we kind of bring technical expertise, which typically what we do is solve it via technology, to actually use the technical expertise in the other way around and said technical expertise says this does not work. And I think this is very important for what um, this tech solutionism that comes in the law nowadays and maybe also helps with the EI does fight in a way, which is how can we show that it doesn't work. And the, here there, is, there should, to me, it is very interesting what civil society links with academia to help academia with which problems to solve, like with this oh bias, like sometimes we don't know how to actually make the technical argument that bias solving does not work, and then we can have this long-termism of all of these things of oh we will solve it in the future because there will be somebody in MIT that will come up with a great solution. Some solutions do not exist. Academia is very bad at accepting this, but it happens, right? But a lot of it actually requires combination and collaboration with stakeholders that can tell you what is the thing that you need to demonstrate doesn't work. And that, right, is something that we don't have, this communication between many times civil society and academia, and that doesn't help academia become your ally. And I think that, again, chat control was a very good example, and some others very good examples of when we cannot produce an alternative, how do we show that what is existing actually is not doing the job and therefore should not exist? I don't know if that helps or not. And yeah, I don't know anything about antitrust. Um, I'm just thinking that framing the answers are non-answers in a way that different stakeholders understand. That is probably one way we could do a lot of things. So thinking about industrial uh, policies or antitrust or whatever, often the language is quite different from how we speak in the digital rights environment, right? So uh, there are certain overlaps. So for instance, we talk about choices in both sides, but what we mean is sometimes slightly different. Um, so that is probably one place where we can go and needs a lot of effort from our end, but I think that's one. Um, the second is with industrial policies, I don't necessarily see it completely as a government thing. Like a lot of the industrial policies we are seeing these days are, in some sense, driven by specific industry motivations, which governments take up and so-called put it into policies, and then the implementation again goes back to the same industry stakeholders. Right? Think about, what is it called, Gaia-X or whatever they were called and they were supposed to be the alternative for the um, Amazon and Microsoft and wait, who's running it? <laughs> so I think it's the chain of events, whether it be within specific industries, so thinking about browsers and different vendors, but also the different advertisers or small players. Uh, so and Kamala mentioned just because you don't use uh, Chrome, if you don't think about it, it'll just trickle down into other browsers. The other aspect, the reason primarily is also that otherwise these browsers will become non-existent, right? Because if all the uh, companies on the other end are serving their websites only for your Chrome, imagine folks who used to use the uh, browsers in 1990s. This website works only with Internet Explorer. If you use any other websites, <laughs> this website will not work, right? You may not get that message explicitly, but that's what will happen. Open it on Brave or Firefox, the website will break. So you'll, you'll just be forced into other options. So that's, that's yeah, that's that. 
Okay, I'm going to use my last words to say industrial policy is a new low interest rate. Uh, okay, so if you know what that means, millions and billions are going into investment in infrastructure right now. It's done under the heading of climate change and, uh, and what have you, and a lot of that money is going to be channeled to tech, right? Uh, and so I think there's a lot of activism to be done on watching that money and working against it. Even though it says it's for climate, it might go for tech. Thank you, everyone. Have a great lunch. See you around.